Mate. My name is Mark Paul from Sydney, Australia. I've been interested in plants all my life, particularly epiphytes and lithophytes. We've, I've designed and built around 300 green wall projects and a sim similar number of gardens and roofs. To me it's always been about the plants and how to accommodate their simple needs. But everything to date has been a retrofit using many different differing techniques. Um, we're yet to have full integration with architecture and engineering where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, here are some steps and ideas on the path to that integration. A holistic approach to a site plan, a plan of management of water, uh, the ecosystems, um, it will power ideas and concepts towards that large, more integrated greening of the built environment. And so, replicating nature. So we've got a, we've got a waterfall in Kakadu, and we've got a, a granite in Zilberg looking back towards Rio in Brazil. So it's these you know, epiphytic and lithophytic plantings that are key to greening cities. So here are some Tillandsia fasciculata, I think in Lucia on power lines. So they're large plants about you know, up to half a metre across. Um, they're in the right aspect in a, in a valley um, with you know, good air movement and moisture. Um, but they're doing fine on power lines. Yeah, landscaping and structural epiphytes is where we started with, so it shows some landscapes using some alcantaras, some apartment buildings in Rio we did. The Grand Vista of Bill Marks is Escape, a, uh, a green wall in Brazil, and some, again, large structural remedies and landscape in Brazil. So here's a dead cyber in a car park in, in Rio, de Janeiro state. And it's dead, but there's you know, still thousands of epiphytes. You know, many bromeliads, you know, orch orchids, cactaceae, jesneriaceae, and um, aroids, of course. So going back to that Inselberg example, and then you know, here's a constructed you know, um, Inselberg in, in Sydney, which we used to do in landscapes. So we used to plant rocks much the same way as you see them in habitat. Here, here's a, uh, a granite inselberg in um, Rio de Janeiro State uh, with Alcantaria imperialis looking straight up the cliff face. Um, I, was, I was amazed when I first you know, went and saw that this is the only place Alcantarias grow, is, is on granite cliff faces. Uh, such useful plants in structural landscape. The roofs we've decorated with, with them in um, Australia, you know, they survive on seasonal rain, so, as they do in Brazil. So here's a here's a roof and a garden, all built. You know the, the gardens on the first first um, um, floor of the house. So the wetland and the tree planting, the rocks are all over the garage of this particular house. And the three roofs pitch into a, a flat roof, which I think that was when it was initially planted. I think it has about 280 species of plants just on the roof now. But again, by the initial irrigation, this is um, just um, seasonal rain that that irrigates this, the rainwater tanks catch the water, the wetland is, is powered by the roof water. Um, Granny's porch garden, this one in uh, Espiritu Santos in Brazil, but that collection of plants that you know, our grandmothers used to collect and share over a cup of tea and swap pieces of plant with each other and some of them were memories of departed relatives or friends and some of them were collected and, or um, acquired when they were on overseas journeys seeing interesting plants elsewhere so, so a lot of these these gardens are collections of memories um, but people have this affinity with plants so to move on you know, this is a sea gypsy village in Borneo and out with their washing they hang all their epiphytes so um, yeah, wherever, wherever people live they decorate it with living plants this is in Puerto Rico, and it's a balcony, but we've seen balconies covered in, in potted plants everywhere in the world, in every high-rise building I've ever seen. So here's one in Redfern in Sydney, very similar thing. Here we are in Austria with the pelagonians on the outside and the phalaenopsis through the double glazed glass on the inside. This is again in Austria. I don't know exactly how to describe that. It's sort of, you know, gothic brutalism with, um, with geraniums. And again, this is in China, lots of little pots that remind me of some green wall systems. Um, you know, just put upstairs with uh, collies to give a pretty amazing patterning. 
uh, our licensee in in uh, Rio, who uh, with his uh, green green wall mobile and his Ute, and uh, there was some interest by the Rio um, state government to actually do their buses. Beside it, there's some um, old deck chairs with Talansias on them, which are from uh, California. So here's a, a typical small green wall we do you know, at the end of a balcony and a, in a garden in Sydney. And we've done innumerable examples of these. Here's the same thing done in an apartment building in Brazil. Another one, another balcony in Sydney. Uh, and this is Bunny's, you know, Granny's garden on her wall. She looks out of her kitchen into a bit of a harbour view, but into other high rises. But she looks out across greenery, and it's that amenity it gives looking out. Um, but they're all so should be amenity, you know, looking in. So if you look at just apartment buildings, and we look at the yellow stripe in the background of the, of the apartment building adjacent, and put all the utilities and the recycled water and the wastewater all on one wall, uh, the dividing walls of, you know, say, three you know, uh, three stripes of apartments in a high-rise, we'd end up with green stripes down buildings. It's it's a very simple thing, so, you know, that, that screening between apartments could possibly be green walls. Um, here's an Inselberg in Rio de Janeiro, so it's just a granite boulder in the in the ocean, right on the surf surf line. So coastal frontal sits out in, in on black algae covered rock, um, with probably about 40 species of plants, but it sits out for five months in um, in the summer drought, um, in blazing sun, and still survives. So these are. Moving along, these are Alcantaric Lasnuiana up on that Inselberg on Pontal Island, and we're looking back at the, the high rise at the edge of Rio. So it's not really you know, rocket science, it's just moving this palette of plants onto those high rise buildings. So here we are, you know, with the Inselberg flora, you know, there are some Cactaceae, a bunch of Chalansias, some Desnarias, some Aroids, and some more Alcantaras at the top of it. And he is actually applying this power of plants into high rises in, in Rio, so in Copacabana and uh, uh, Ipanema apartments. So it's a big flora, you know, growing on the apartment buildings. Here we are. I think this is a Copacabana apartment, and there are the Inselberg uh, plants. And right behind them, you can see them actually growing on the Inselberg, so it's not too big a ass to just move some of this you know, flora onto the buildings. Uh, more apartments in Rio. Of course the access issues you have with all these things, whether it be knuckle lift, um, you know, fork lift, pole lift, um, you know, abseiling, uh, BMU units. Yeah. So another story. Okay, so here's a um, a 22 story building in Melbourne where we did interior green walls up all the stair internal staircases. So there's um, um, a couple of blank power generating and water recycling um, levels in this particular building, but it's a retrofit and uh, there are 18 stories of green walls. So it becomes a, a living lung up the spine of the building. So everyone in the building walks you know, up and down that aren't using their lifts um, across the face of the green wall. Um, this is 22 stories up, and this is Anthurian Grandiflorum from Dominican Republic. And again, it's flowering, and we collected seed off it this year and uh, reset seedlings for other walls. Again, these are the stairs going up the face of the green walls. They're actually all green walls on every level in this particular building. Okay, so we're going to repeat the same thing, the same, you know, sort of uh, lithotic flora in Sydney. So this is Sydney sandstone escarpment, you know, on the, on uh, pit water. So, uh, in Gophra costata and, and rocks. And of course, we have our own insulated flora in Sydney. So we've got um, Plectranthus parva floras here and a peperomia, a ficus. And associated ferns. Here are Dendrobium speciosum and Leparis flexulosa. 
uh, forming a little association again on these uh, sandstone escarpments. Again, they get summer full sun, uh, seasonal seasonal rain, and uh, sit for long periods of drought. So dendrobium speciosum used in landscape, you know, on a rock, on, on rocks where where they would grow. Again, you know, um, used in in landscape. Dendrobium speciosum. So here we have little ledges in a in a sandstone wall, which become you know planting ledges for dendrobium speciosum. Um, here's dendrobium speciosum growing again with its associated um, peperomias and uh, debalias, uh, as you would find it on the cliff face growing in one of our green walls. Here, in fact, my oldest green wall from 26 years ago <laughs> with the same dendrobium speciosum and um, uh, some debalia and adiantum and its whole pallet of little friends, areas that it lives with. Um, so it's these groups of plants and their associations. Um, so these are some of the early green walls I did. This is the one on the left side, a flight of stairs in my house, but it was just simply a, a bunch of pocket plantings on lattice, um, pots with coat hangers, um, and arrows climbing up from ground level that formed a green wall, and then another green wall upstairs at Brisbane City Council. Another technique we used from those early days were um, individual plantings of, um, you know, like pocket plantings. This is on a tilt slab wall, which is about 24 square metres, and I think um, this cost about, you know, about six or seven hundred dollars a square metre to end up with a green wall like that. So two years later, it looks like a green wall. So the pseudo green wall way of growing things up from the bottom, and um, then having an inorganic substrate and irrigating it um, is very successful. The same, the same house. Uh, so again, it's um, the garage is under the under the deck. Um, it's in a high-rise complex of apartments, um, but it makes an enormous difference to the built environment. Um, here's, here's another one we looked at earlier from the roof. So it's, this is over, all over the garage below. So there's a, actually a pond, a wet lab with reels of plants. There's a planted tree in a container planting, a podium planting. There's a green roof and green walls, but it all form, forms part of the same system where the water runs off the roof. Through, um, through the green roof to water storage, um, the pond recycles through the water storage, the green wall works off the nutrients of the pond, so on and so forth. And this particular green wall has got 160 species of plants on it, so there's always about 20 things flowering. Uh, me and um, a mate of mine, Bruce Dunstan, in uh, Panama on a friend's green wall that Carla Black uh, constructed a, a rock wall and planted it out with a whole lot of epiphytic plants from the Continental Divide. So when we were there a few years ago, we completely you know, re replanted it to fit the different little groupings of uh, plants that worked well together in different amounts of moisture. A lot of the you know, the uh, orchids and tillandsias were too dry for her wet wall and uh, had to be moved onto the back of the wall. Um, but it was uh, pretty fun going and collecting plants um, to replant the wall. So we spent a week collecting stuff and a, and a couple of days um, you know, replanting the wall. So biodiversity is an important thing and actually go out and going out and looking at plants in habitat um, you know, it gives you a lot better range of ideas of you know, how to replicate those things or to copy those things in your own green walls and roofs. Um, you know, biodiversity is you know, very important in walls and roofs and uh, preserving that biodiversity by using them in, in uh, landscape, but particularly using them to clothe our cities in greenery is an important part of this as well. So examples of, so the front walkway is a deck which underneath is the rainwater collection tank and then we have green walls and a little um, wetland, a little wetland column which you know, strips nutrients by running the, the uh, pond water over it. You have a bog garden a, a pond, and a pond. You know, it's a little, a little tiny ecosystem on a mini scale that has formed part of one of our landscapes. It's these sorts of things that are 
uh, little steps towards you know, how you can green cities with a variety of techniques. Here's a carp and tortoise pond with the bottom two metres of this green wall being again a, a vertical wetland uh, and used to strip nutrients out of the, out of the pond to keep the, the water clear. Um, so again wetland plants at the base of it, a uh, very healthy wall. I suppose in winter when it's absolutely freezing, you know, using a ladder out of a pond because it's the only way you can actually access this wall easily in an uh, internal courtyard in Sydney. Here's another one. This is the Global Change Institute at um, University of Queensland in, in um, Queensland. University of Queensland, Queensland, great. Um, so it's got a wetland full of rainbow fish. The bottom um, section of Greenwall is a vertical wetland. Uh, so it strips the nutrients, aerates the water, returns to the pond. Fish waste you know, keeps the plants growing. Um, the pond system wasn't big enough to do the upper two sections of wall and also um, irrigating from rainwater the upper two sections means that if the pond pump fails on the, on the bottom wetland it'll still get water from the upper walls and uh, yeah, uh, until you can get it you know, operating again. Um, blade green walls, these are, these are up either side of an internal staircase so when you're looking out into the building next door you're actually looking out across greenery and uh, the blades work quite well on those oblique angles because if you, from everywhere bar, directly in front of the facade um, uh, the whole building, the whole facade of the building looks green. Uh, here are blades again used on a, on a entry to one of the hotels, Bridgeway Hotel in Brisbane Here's some apartments that look directly out onto a blank you know, building wall and so by staggering blades up and down every apartment gets a view of greenery looking out from their balcony. Um, these are eco pillows which are just straight on, a, on compressed cement. Um, so it's five, four hundred by eight hundred eco pillows on seasonal rain sitting on a roof in Sydney. These are the same eco pillows used you know, at the coastal frontal location in, in um, Auckland. So it gets incredible um, wind and scouring and salt spray. Um, you know, the pellet of plants is likely native to the, the cliff faces in um, New Zealand. Um, these are eco pillows on uh, one of the, uh, my roof in Sydney. And so um, all those buckets there are some of our critically endangered you know, um, native Plectranthus species. Um, I think we harvested five buckets at the end of that summer which went back to the botanic gardens for propagation. So it shows you can actually do something even on a small roof in Sydney. This is uh, one of those endangered species, Plectranthus cremnus, growing on the edge of the roof. Uh, again, showing this roof a bit older with more, more planting that was on the original one, but the three pitching roofs in the central one means that yeah, it's self sufficient from you know, yeah, irrigation. How old? One of our World Heritage um, um, rated islands. So, and of course, it's got about 240 species of plants, most of which are endemic, and it's powered by seabirds and their guanco. So, you know, you know, thin green walls on the surfaces. Um, you could have pocket plantings to take all the larger trees and palms, but you know, this could very well be a, a plan, a, a city with a plan of management. Uh, so it's actually moving forward and looking at these examples of that is what we need to be doing. Lastly, this is Santa Marta favela in uh, Rio, and uh, with. Bruno Rosen Silver, our licensees there, we, we you know, decided to do these pet bottle green walls, um, which we did, um, which he, he did several projects um, in Rio in the favelas using all the school kids to try and green the favela walls. It's about 600 pet bottles to make about 10 square metres. You cut a pocket in the side, they all link into each other, you drip irrigate them, they collect the plant cuttings and you end up with a green wall. So here are a couple of them done in Rio and then here we are back in Sydney more recently doing the same thing in schools as an education tool. So they're recycling, collecting all the pet bottles, processing them all so they can use them for plants, yeah, planting them all 
and getting all the entire school involved it takes about you know, generally three months to collect all the pet bottles and uh, this is some of the projects going in we've sort of streamlined this now but it looks as though you know uh, land care australia are going to pick it up and and provide the three thousand dollars of funding for all the raw materials and irrigation system and things to do it and allow you know 400 schools a year or or fund 400 schools a year to do it so here's the rainwater tank that you know, generates the water for the, the green wall that's it after it's actually installed and here's another school with another project and this is it on installation um, this is what it looks like at completion so you know, educating kids is an important thing in um, greening technologies um, that's about it thanks